Welcome to section 322 of the grandstand here under the Twin Spires and welcome to what has been for the past four years our most downloaded episode of this podcast, our Kentucky Derby Hardcore Handicappers pop up now in its fifth year. We will, as always, talk about each and every horse in Saturday's field for the Run for the Roses, led by the morning line favorite, Bluegrass Stakes winner Zandon. But this time, what's different is we're fully integrated into the Horse Racing Nation team. You come to know them as handicappers in our rotation every week on this podcast now they're together for this meeting of equine minded human minds first we have the man who created horse racing nation and derby wars and has worked in countless phases of this game and an astute handicapper in his own right i call him boss you call him mark midland derby time mark what are your initial thoughts about kentucky derby 148 I mean, it's probably one of the best betting races in years, right? It's an exciting field, a deep field. It's a lot of fun. It's going to be a, a great race on Saturday. Next, one of the best young handicappers anywhere. And she's created her own brand, Outrun the Odds. She's on social media at that handle. Can't miss her, and you don't want to, because she's constantly cashing multi-race bets every time I turn around. Here's Sarah El Badwi. Sarah, are you going to do that again on Saturday or sooner? Oh, let's hope. I mean, that's the plan. Uh, Churchill Downs historically not my best betting track, but I'm hoping that being a local in the area and spending some more time focusing on it will change that. And as Mark said, the Derby is looking to be a very competitive race. Definitely some possibilities for some value in there. Yeah, for, for Sarah to not to be her best betting track, that just makes her that much more focused. And trust me, that won't be lasting terribly long. She'll turn it around, believe me. Finally, I saved a Churchill Downs maven himself for last. He worked here more than a decade as a TV host and handicapper. He's come aboard with us in terms of marketing and that handicapping knowledge certainly generates plenty of buzz on Twitter and crunches numbers like no one, especially the most important one, return on investment. Here's Mr. ROI himself, Ed DeRosa. Well, I would say uh, if I'm right about this year's Derby, uh, it'll be the most successful betting race in my life. Wow. Well, right. there's a tease. All right. If I'm tuned. right. <laughs> if you're right. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know that that's as big an if as you're making it's it sound. It's a big but, if. But okay. All right. It'll... I have to tamp down all the modesty on the team today. Hey, coming up, we will go over each and every horse one by one. But before I do, let me make sure that if you want to be a smart horse player, then before you play the Kentucky Derby, you owe it to yourself to check out the super screener from Horse Racing Nation created by Mike Shuddy, who's going to be on the pod Friday, by the way. The super screener is a proven system based on years of analysis and results. If you've used it, you already know Super Screener has shown you what's important and what's not when you're handicapping the biggest races every week, or in this case, the biggest race of the year. It reveals the bad favorites, who to use, who to toss, tells you who the pretenders are, so you can instantly lower the cost of your wagers. The Super Screener uncovers live long shots that you can use to boost payoffs up to 10 times. Just in time for Kentucky Derby 148, there's a special edition of the Super Screener just for the big race. Normally priced at $99, you can get it right now for just $49. You heard right, $49, that's it. To get proprietary insight and exclusive information that will optimize your bets on the Derby. So why not try it? Go to picks.horseracingnation.com. That's picks, P-I-C-K-S, dot horseracingnation.com. This is the Hardcore Handicappers edition of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. I'm at Churchill Downs and back at the home office of Horse Racing Nation, the HRN team. Let's go ahead and jump into the Kentucky Derby. We got 20 horses. We'll get through 10 of them right away and then digest that a little bit and also talk a little bit about the Kentucky Oaks on Friday. But first things first, they'll go a mile and a quarter for the 148th year in a row. 20 three-year-olds are lined up, plus two also eligibles. All Colts this year. It's the 12th of 14 races on Saturday, 6.57 p.m. Eastern time here at the Downs. The National Weather Service telling us a chance of showers with thunderstorms possible after 2 Eastern, mostly cloudy with a high near 70, and the chance of precipitation, it's an even money bet, 50-50. All right, let's go through them now from the rail out, and we'll start with number one, Mo Donegal. He, of course, coming in for Todd Pletcher, two-time winner of this race, coming off of a narrow victory in the Wood Memorial back on April 9th. Irod Ortiz will be in the irons, and as far as the morning line odds are concerned, 10 to 1, best price in Las Vegas, 14 to 1 at the Westgate at the time we were recording 
on Tuesday morning. Ed, let's start with you and start All with right. Mo Donegal. Uh, well, I'm not as bearish on the inside draw for him. I think anyone who's going to get the rail, I would say, being a dead closer, probably preferred to any other running style. So it didn't really affect my assessment of his chances, which I have on my fair outs line at 12 to 1. Uh, certainly enough pace if the race completely collapses. I think he's the beneficiary along with morning line favorite Zandon uh, in the mix for me. And uh, given that I like a couple prices, I won't let him beat me out of the exotics, but just a, a mid-market candidate in my mind. All right, Sarah, how about you? I think what you say is uh, it makes sense as far as you would want a closer to be the one that is taking that inside spot. And with the 20 stall gate rather than the two auxiliaries, this doesn't affect him as much as it would in past years. However, of course, I don't think that that was the ideal place to be for any horse. You kind of have that cringe and yikes in the room when any horse draws the rail, especially one that you think is going to be one of the more top contenders in some people's minds. So he's up there for me. His running style certainly seems to fit well in this year's group. He's run a lot of very promising races against some of the toughest company, especially that Remsen as a two-year-old. And he's, he's a possibility. The last time a rail horse won the Derby, 1986 with Ferdinand. Mark? Yeah, Mo Donegal is one of my top two choices here, and uh, the rail is definitely a concern. Uh, the best thing I can say about that is I read Ortiz and Todd Pletcher had the rail last year. It didn't work out. I think it was a good learning experience for Irad, and I think he's probably going to take this horse back a little further. Um, in general, though, I, I see this as a race with a lot of pace. There's there's more pace in this derby than we've seen in many years. Uh, you know, Summers tomorrow could go out and, and really set a good pace for some of the others to chase. And the thing I like about Modonegal and, and I'll throw Zandon in that same camp is when they ran that big Remsen, you know, that they were sort of derby contenders and pointed from this race from that day. And that's sort of the traditional way to win the derby. Uh, and you know, it, the last few years, it's been a lot of like front runners and like, you know, horses that kind of pop up late, like justify or come into their own in, in the spring. Um, but traditionally, the way to win it was to have a, a good two year old prep. And uh, I think these, you know, he fits, he's working well, he's going to get the distance. And the way he came home in, in the wood was very impressive. So if he can work out a trip, I think he's very dangerous. Todd Pletcher has won the Derby with Super Saver and Always Dreaming. Irad Ortiz Jr. looking for his first Derby victory. To number two and another closer, and this is Happy Jack. He comes in off a third place finish and a distant one at that in the Santa Anita Derby. In fact, he's just a maiden winner on his debut for Doug O'Neill. Rafael Bejarano will be in the irons. The number two horse is 30 to one on the morning line, 90 to one best price at Circa in Las Vegas. Sarah? This is one of the first tosses for me, um, getting into the field, kind of inheriting those derby points after tailing the likes of the other Californians, such as Messier, Forbidden Kingdom, who is no longer a part of things, and then Taba as well. He's kind of been the one to run along and pick up the pieces, but he was distant to those horses, and I think he faces much tougher company in here with a full field of 20. He could be running along to maybe pick up a slice of a super at a huge price if the pace completely collapses, but this isn't one I have my eye on. Mark, do you concur? Yeah, I, I think Happy Jack's a complete toss in here and, uh, you know, not a bad horse and maybe he'll find himself at a, at a grade two or grade three level. But I think with 20 horses here, you can toss him with confidence. Ed, uh, I would agree with uh, the first two. Are you making it unanimous? Uh, certainly on the win end, he's tough to like, even at the 90 to one you quoted at 30 to one morning line, even less interest, obviously. I think Happy Jack, though, is a horse that you kind of can use as an example of a big difference between picking the winner of this race and how to bet this race. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be completely shocked if he just happened to end up clunking up for fourth. And, you know, if you love Zandon and Epicenter, who are the top two choices, your strategy, and, and I wouldn't talk anyone off this, and I might look at it myself, could be to key this horse in fourth behind the very logical contenders. And we've seen that blow up the dollar super a few times, even to get the bomb in fourth with the logicals. And should he third seems to be the ceiling in my mind. But that's how I would approach him. His numbers 
are faster than Barber Road for a lot of people who like that one to, to kind of slide into the super. So he's interesting to me from a standpoint, he's completely ignored by everybody. And I wouldn't want to get beat by him in fourth if I'm completely right yeah. about everything else. But as a win candidate, no thanks. Okay. I think we're going from one that's an absolute toss, at least on the top of the tickets, to one that you have to figure out where to include him. He is the horse that was favored most of the winter and most of the spring in the futures markets, both in Las Vegas and even in the Churchill Downs Paramutuals. And we're talking about Epicenter. He, of course, has won twice at the grade two level in the Risen Star and in the Louisiana Derby. He'll be closer to the pace, certainly, than the first two horses we've mentioned. Steve Asmussen looking to break his O for 23 Schneid. This could yet be a horse that would be the favorite, and if so, would be Asmussen's first. Joel Rosario, who won on Orb back in 2013, the last time a closer, crossed the finish line first in the Kentucky Derby, this time on a more forwardly placed horse, trying to get his second Derby win. Epicenter, to some Surprise, including mine, not the favorite on the morning line at seven to two, but Paul Zilm at Circuit told me he was seeing money before that coming in on Epicenter. And so now he is a de facto favorite as well in Las Vegas at plus 490, nearly five to one at Circa. Mark, what say you about Epicenter? So this is probably my strongest opinion on the race, but um, obviously Epicenter's done a lot, but uh, I'm a little down on, on all the excitement about him. I think uh you know while he did beat smile happy and zandon in, in in the risen star he got a very easy pace that day uh it really just kind of gifted him the race and uh when he got a bit you know a lot more pace in the lecompte he folded against horses like epicenter and papa cap that are nowhere near this derby field and uh i just don't like the spot where you know he's in the three post summers tomorrow's in the four messier's in the six and i think that the four and the six are going to have more options to go it's going to force up the center's hand and uh you know so I, I don't really like him for the win spot here i'm going to try to beat him and uh you know certainly can run second or third but uh i'm going to look for others ed what about you and i know you're a guy who looks for value did the fact that he was not the morning line favorite entice you a little bit with this horse more so than he would have been yeah uh, i think especially in the exotics i mean the wind pool is kind of its own animal on derby day um some of the promo bets going around and things like that. I definitely think in the exotics, he'll be right there with Zandon co-favored. I wish Churchill released like the total bet in each pool because I think it'd be really fascinating to see the how horses take money in different spots, uh, maybe one day. Uh, but he's a use for me and, and part of my comfort level with using him, even he's a he's an underlay based on my fair odds, but I do like two horses that are absolutely going to be prices, which we'll get to later. Okay. So for me, trying to identify the horses who are most likely to run well at the board, I do think Epicenter and the other favorite are those two. And I just have to be right about my you know longer price gamble. But it's I can't ignore his consistency. Uh, love the Risen Star, Gate to Wire, and then Pressing in the Louisiana Derby. It's a lot of professionalism to me. And then most important as a data guy, the numbers stack up. He's as fast as anyone else and is absolutely in the mix for me, though I do agree with Mark that of all the top contenders, he probably got the worst draw. Sarah, coming out of the three hole, Ed mentioning it there. Of course, he's got a couple closers to his left, so maybe that's not as much of a problem. But of course, you got the bottleneck to the right. And so how are you looking at the trip for Epicenter and maybe the bet on or against Epicenter? Right. I think the post certainly doesn't do him any favors, but as far as a patient jockey, I don't think you could ask for anybody more patient and more accepting of getting into trouble and figuring a way to get out of it. Doesn't panic. Joel Rosario is one of, you know, he knows what he's doing out there and he's not going to get flustered even in a 20 horse field, even on Derby Day. He's going to figure out a way to make a trip happen for this horse. The three certainly doesn't help him. I wish he was getting that six hole that Messi ended up getting at the post draw. There were those two spots left and we were all kind of like, what's it going to be? Um, certainly can't dismiss him. He's a model of consistency, but I don't see him as a horse that's gotten into any significant trouble really and still been able to pull out a win. Um, there are other horses that I think have had to really show their grit and tenacity to overcome trouble trips and he's not one of those for me. 
Bear in mind one thing about fairgrounds, which normally up until a few years ago had not produced derby winners, but well, thanks to some asterisks, Country House in 2019 and then Mandaloon last year both came out of fairgrounds. And in fact, after they got done moving horses around because of the disqualification of Medina Spirit this past winter, four of the top five finishers in last year's derby came out of the Louisiana Derby. So maybe food for thought or not. Number four coming in from the UAE, not only from the race there, but basically based there. And that would be Summer is Tomorrow. Runner up in the UAE Derby, uh, trained by Bupat Simar. His uncle is, has been the trainer by name, but because of his association with an owner who is associated with the controversial president of Chechia, the entire stable was moved to nephew Bupat's name. And so that's why there's a little bit of a political complication here. Hmm. Oh, there's also this complication. This horse has never won past a sprint distance. So we'll be trying the mile and a quarter for the first time, as will the rest of the field. Mikhail Barcelona, who has very, very limited experience here at Churchill Downs, will be riding in his first derby. 30 to one on the morning line for summer is tomorrow and 80 to one at Circa. Ed? I'd rather bet Happy Jack at 90 than this horse at 80, I tell you that. Uh, I give him very little chance to win. I think he's 200 to one plus on my fair odds. I just don't see how he wins this race, Gates of Wire, which maybe is the plan. He's certainly not going to sit off and outkick anyone, excuse me, and outkick anyone else home. I don't like him in any spot in the Super. Uh, if he is a factor in any way, I'm losing. Sarah, as Ed just mentioned, and it has been mentioned, we're looking at this horse to be on the early lead or at least very, very near. It's a question, of course, where he'll be at the end. Where do you think he will be? So out of all the things that I have zero confidence in going into this year's Kentucky Derby, the thing that I'm most confident in so far is that this horse is going. They are going to the front early, and I think that he is going to end up sticking around for quite a bit longer than some people might expect. I don't see him as a win candidate, but just remember, Crown Pride just barely got to him, and he was going very quickly in UAE. So the intention is very clear, especially with the more inside-drawn post from the four-hole we're going to see him on the lead early, and uh, I'm interested to see how far he can take it. He has more foundation than a lot of other horses coming into here with more career starts than many of our American horses. I think he is a very interesting player, and he adds a lot of dimension to the pace in this race, but I don't see him out kicking the rest of the speed horses, the stalkers, pressers, and then every closer that comes along for the mile and the quarter. Yeah, this colt by summer front you would think is bred for the turf, but uh, is also bred here in Kentucky by Brereton Jones. Mark? Yeah, I would agree completely with what Sarah said. And But, you know, the important point about this horse is he's a really key factor in the race. Well, he, I don't expect him to hit the board in any way. Uh, how, you know, does he break well? Does he get to the lead? And how long does he keep that lead? you know, really is a thorn in the side of, of not just epicenter, but potentially Messier. And, uh, you know, the trainer, uh, I talked to the trainer a couple of times this week. He says the horse has gotten to the lead in sprints. The plan is to go to the lead. Um, so assuming he breaks well, I, I think he's going to be there for a while, like Sarah said. And um, in the super screener, uh, Mike Shuddy did a nice job of estimating sort of the, the brisk pace call. And he, he gave uh, this horse a 99 and a 105. And that really fits with the rest of this field. So the fact that they are wanting to go, they're on the inside. If they do go and, and, and he's around for a long time, that could create, you know, this, um, you know, 46 uh, for, for the half mile, maybe 45 and four, something like that. That's just going to create more challenge. And that's a lot different than what we've seen in, in recent years, uh, like with Medina Spirit last year, uh, where he was sort of unchallenged. So um, really key to the race, but no shot himself. Let's go to number five, Smile Happy. He has a win here at Churchill Downs, and that hasn't always been a bellwether. In fact, it rarely is in terms of trying to find a derby winner. Part of the reason for that is there are no three-year-old preps for derby horses here at Churchill Downs, what with the season only opening a week before the Kentucky Derby. But he did win the Kentucky Jockey Club here in his second start back in the fall and since finished second in the Risen Star and in the Bluegrass to Epicenter and to Zandon, respectively. He is trained by Kenny McPeak. He is ridden by Corey Lannery. Run Happy, the sire from our friend and sponsor, 
Mattress Mac Jim McInvale. I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about him between now and Derby Day. 20 to 1 for Smile Happy now. Once was a, a lot more uh, respected in terms of a, a price, in part because Mattress Mac did put a big bet on him back in an early Derby future. 20 to 1 as well at the Westgate. Sarah? This horse has never been one that's really been on my radar. I know that everybody was really highly touting him when he was a two-year-old, and he does come out of that very key Kentucky Jockey Club. Uh, he can win as a three-year-old before I place a bet on him. And to me, the Kentucky Derby, when you haven't won as a three-year-old and really shown that that two-year-old form does now completely fit with the top contenders, such as Epicenter, such as Zandon, it's a pass for me. All right. Uh, Mark, how about you? So this is one that, that I've liked all, all winter. Um, I didn't mind his bluegrass. What's actually uh, turned, uh, turned me off a little bit is, you know, talking to the trainer and Docky, they seem to be wanting to stay closer. Um, you know, his win at Churchill Downs, uh, I guess he came, you know, from fifth by four, but he, you know, he was kind of closed on the field. And uh, with the Risen Star, they were eighth by five. They're feeling like they want to be closer and closer. And I'm seeing this race as, as more pace. Um, that being said, I do I do respect him and and I put him in the camp from uh, um, Modonegal and Zandon. Is this is a horse that was stamped for this race in November? Um, he's you know he's coming off two preps, not not only just two preps, but one in February and one in April, having marched off. So he should improve uh, and have you know be in better shape off of the April race. I just really would love to see him back further in the field. So um, I'm not going to use him strongly. I would maybe use him a little bit defensively. And I think this is a horse that, you know, he could turn up in the Preakness and run a giant race because he's only had two races so far. Mm, interesting. The two wins he had, he was not favored. The two losses he had, he was. Ed? Uh, it sounds like I like him a little more than my colleagues. And 20 to 1, I would actually say, is a fair price. I expect him to be less than that in a few days. Um, you spring the latch. Uh, it's, it fascinates me sometimes how, you know, when you get beat, the luster comes off, um, and understandably so in certain cases. But, you know, Zandon's not in there, gets traffic trouble, and Smile Happy makes that move and draws off. And for whatever reason, Zandon doesn't get there. We're talking about a horse who's probably eight to one. Uh, and maybe even, you know, with the excitement of having won the Bluegrass, Mattress Mac is talking about making his big bet on him. And then he's even shorter. Uh, now you're getting what I thought is a good 15, 16 to one on a horse who's really done nothing wrong like to maybe see a little more right this year as Sarah pointed out with no wins but uh he's he's in the mix for me at this price uh I'd say the bigger red flag of anything we haven't talked about would be the workout definitely not going according to plan um uh, by pretty much everyone's admission that was involved uh so that's a negative but again at 15 16 to 1 based on what we saw in that final prep I think we're getting the right price uh he's a solid B for me from number five, Smile Happy, to number six, Messier. Is this an under-the-radar horse? Believe it or not, is one of the supposed big four for this race. That's kind of the buzz about him. He comes in for Tim Yakteen. He's one of the two Baftines in this race, originally with Bob Baffert, transferred to Yakteen amid the controversy surrounding the suspension of Baffert and that he is persona non grata here at Churchill Downs for another year and change and also serving a 90-day suspension that is covered nationwide. So Yakteen, the longtime assistant both to Baffert and Charlie Whittingham and a longtime trainer in his own name, takes over. It's John Velasquez who has won three Kentucky Derbies recently and would have had a fourth last year if not for the disqualification of Medina Spirit. He will be in the irons. Eight to one on the morning line coming off a second place finish in the Santa Anita Derby. And to me, it was a, an impressive second place finish to Stablemate Taba. Uh, if you're looking at Las Vegas prices, 10 to one at the Westgate. Mark? Yeah, he's more of a B for me. I, I, I respect Messier, and and like I said, he can kind of sit off if he want if Johnny V wants to sit off of of, a, of an epicenter at Summers tomorrow. Maybe sit third, have a really nice spot. Um, you know, I think one thing people have forgotten a little bit. Again, this horse was off of a layoff too, coming into the last race where he right. kind of got a little tired at the end. Um, I, I I'm thinking a little bit more for second with this horse or third. Um, but I think, with, again, he's really key because I think uh, 
I'm kind of thinking about the strength of Messier and Epicenter kind of battling on that second half of the backside going into the far turn. And I think that's really a lot of where this race is going to be won or lost. And uh, if those two go at it hard, then that's going to sit up for a couple of the closers. Uh, if, if they don't or somebody, you know, puts one and puts the other away, then, then the race could be over. Um, but I think it's somebody that, you know, he factors squarely in the mix and, uh, you know, We'll just have to see what uh, he brings on race day. Ed, uh, you know it's it's inter he's really interesting to me because I think if this were uh, a graded stake on a Saturday in July and I was just cracking open my Brisnet PPs and looked at these horses, uh, is almost a lifetime user of Brisnet. I think he'd be my pick. Uh, just on paper. Um, he really stands out against this group at the price, especially. I mean, maybe you'd say, well, he's right there with the other two, but he's eight to one on the morning line and they're three to one and seven to two. So uh, paper wise, I'm kind of surprised. I don't like him a little more. And admittedly, uh, when you do this every day, the other things swirling around this horse are going to get in your head. I certainly like him more than the stable mate a lot, a lot more. Uh, and at eight, 10 to one, uh, I, I just, can't let him beat me with the other horses I like at much bigger prices. Uh, and I think he could end up being the beneficiary if he gets the right trip behind the no hope speed types like Summers Tomorrow and Classic Causeway. So he's super dangerous to me. Admittedly, don't really want to see him win, uh, but I want to win money more than anything else. So I have to use him. Sarah, this, uh, in terms of a storyline, this smells like Medina's spirit all over again. What do you think? Well, I think you have to really bring up the question of what is Johnny's V's intentions? Because they have won so many derbies and other races, just send and go to the front, just send and go to the front. And I remember I was watching during last year's Kentucky Derby, a interview with him where he won one of the races on the undercard and, and he's talking to with I think it was Donna Brothers and he says we're going and I said well then the he wins because no one else was going to go but I think this year's race is going to set up quite a bit differently so I wonder if that's something that's going on in his mind as well of well summer is tomorrow is going so I'm gonna have to sit back or if he thinks nope I've done this before we're going Everyone will leave me alone out there for whatever reason that it continues to happen where they leave Johnny alone on the front end. But if they do, I think that Messier has got a huge chance. And if they don't, he takes back and he saves his horse to make a stalking type of move. He still has a huge chance. The one question I have with this horse is the distance possibly because he rated pretty well off of Forbidden Kingdom last time opened up and then another horse came and got him. And that may be one of the most talented horses we've seen so far, or Messier might just not be able to get the kind of mile and a quarter distance as he continues to stretch out. I don't usually want to see in a horse like this past performances that he loses at low sal to slow down Andy. It's kind of a red flag to me. Let's go from California to Japan by way of the Middle East. And we take you to crown pride. This is a horse that comes in trying to break an 0 for 16 Schneid for UAE Derby horses coming to the Derby. In fact, the best that a horse from that race in Maidan has done, or even before that at the old place in Nadal Sheba, has been fifth place. Nothing better than that in the 16 tries that a horse from the UAE Derby has made coming here to Kentucky. But what's different about this one? Well, for one, this Japanese horse has been putting up some lights out workouts here since he got to Churchill Downs for another. Uh, OK, yes, he won the UAE Derby. We've been there and done that before. And you've got Koichi Shintani training Christophe Lemaire, five time champion rider in Japan who will be in the irons. But here's what's different now. You have Japan having won two Breeders' Cup races last year, five races on the undercard of the Dubai World Cup and four before that on the undercard of the Saudi Cup. So Japan has been coming to play. And in the words of our friend Kate Hunter, professional liaison for racing from Japan, she said if they were able to win two Breeders' Cup races with their horses back last fall, that they would be cooking with gas going forward. You can almost believe that to a great degree. 20 to one on the morning line for Crown Pride. 33 to one at Circa. Ed, I'll start with you. 
Well, everyone knows that either wood or electric is better than cooking with gas. So <laughs> what's the same? You know, you listed all the things that are different. I'll tell you what's the same. A horse shipping from UAE on five to six weeks rest, in this case, six weeks, to the Kentucky Derby. Japan, yeah, that's different. But it was different a few years ago when Coolmore tried to do it. No, well, Coolmore's never done it. And right. look what they've done all over the world. And Mendelssohn was an embarrassment to those who picked him. I had him as an A. And at six to one or whatever he was, it was a horrible bet. I can't believe I got suckered in because it was Aiden O'Brien and Coolmore. And I vowed it will never happen again. And Crown Pride, uh, as much as I'm still stinging and smarting uh, from the Japanese uh, nabbing Dunbar Road, I did like love Loves Only You. Uh, I have a ton of respect for what they do. I would go so far as to say they're probably the preeminent breeding and racing operation in the world now as a nation. But this is a bridge too far. UAE to Churchill does not work. And at 18, 20 to one, I have no interest in using this horse in any spot in any wager. The last 25 horses to come to the Kentucky Derby off of a race in a foreign country have failed to win. And with that, we bring it Sarah to weigh in on this uh, Japanese opportunity. I think that all of these past stats obviously want to make you completely toss this horse, but as you mentioned, all the things that are different this year, this isn't a typical horse that kind of sucked up to win a uh, points prep in another country that they're like, well, we have the points, we have to go take the shot. The entire Japanese breeding and training industry has really stepped up to be a globally dominating factor, winning those few Breeders' Cup races. And then during the Saudi Cup card, during the Dubai World Cup card, we're seeing something that we, I don't think, have seen before as far as the horses that can compete on every level and be successful against American horses. And I think that it speaks a lot to the training programs that they have going there. He's, he's a, I'm on the fence still about him. I'm rooting mm. for him and I don't think he's a complete toss, but I wonder what the ramifications of a win from him would be. Oh. And, and honestly, I, I would be kind of okay with them if trainers in the U S have to take a look at, what the Japanese are doing differently and kind of adapt to be able to play on their level. All right, uh, Sarah and Ed, Mark, have crystallized all my thoughts eloquently. So you want to break the tie here? Yeah, I mean, we've all seen what the Japanese horses have done at the international events. Um, I think that's actually going to make this horse an underlay. I think he's probably an underlay at 20 to 1. And, you know, I think he could even be 18 to 1 or something like that. And I think it just kind of falls in the Mendelssohn camp, like Ed was talking about. Um, absolutely, we've seen what the Japanese horses have done at Dubai and Saudi and others, but that doesn't make this the horse. There's nothing that says, you know, if you look at this horse's running lines in Japan, um, that says that this is the horse. Um, again, uh, looking at the super screener, Mike Shetty did a nice job detailing. This was one of the slowest UAE derbies in years. Yes. So this is not a good race. Um, if you, the time form uh, US does figures uh, around the world, it's not a good figure. And then if we go back to summers tomorrow, as nice as a race summers tomorrow ran, he was a sprinter going long for the first time. And Crown Pride took the entire stretch, not changing leads and got by him at the end. So, you know, I, I don't see it. I mean, if you want to put him in third in the trifecta, I, I wouldn't. What, I may do that and wouldn't talk anyone off that just on one ticket, but I, I don't see it. And I think, you know, their horses will make an impact uh, at some point, but I don't think this is the one. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to be so on the fence with this. I'm, I'm afraid to not include him deep in exotics, but will not play him to win. How does that sound uh, with the That's crown good. pride? Charge it for Todd Pletcher, one of his three coming in at number eight in the field. By the way, when uh, it was interesting, when Crown Pride drew first and got number seven, I thought, oh, if only it had been number eight because of the Asian symmetry with the lucky number eight, but uh, it was not to be. Charge it wound up getting that. And uh, you look at Charge it, this is a horse that's lightly raced. We talk about Taba, but Charge it almost as lightly raced, coming off Lasix for the first time, finished second in the Florida Derby after a previous win, breaking a maiden second time out for Todd Pletcher. It will be Luis Saez who will be in the irons. Uh, so we're looking at the morning line for number eight of 20 to one and the best price in Las Vegas for Charge it, 25 to one at the Westgate. Sarah? 
I think that 20 to 1 or 25 to 1 is an absolute pipe dream. This is the horse that a lot of people are kind of thinking of as their wise guy horse, which I don't know how often that horse really wins. But this is a horse that's at the top of the list right now for me. I've liked what I've seen from him since he broke his maiden. Uh, to have fight the whole way around and be basically in a speed duel for the entire length of the race with another horse and then just get beat at the end, come back and absolutely crush. And then in the Florida Derby is just his third start, taking dirt for the first time, having to swing around horses and go wide. And then clearly being one of the few that I felt really had a handle of the distance and could stretch out to this mile and a quarter with ease. I know a lot of people are talking about this horse as their Belmont horse. He needs to find a little bit more maturity, but as far as trainers, I would trust to make that happen. Todd Pletcher is at the top of that list. Mark? Kind of torn on this one. Um, you know, it's interesting how the Tappets have done so, been dominating at Belmont, but they haven't done anything at Derby. And uh, Ed and I were talking about this the other day. You know, I pulled the list of, of Tappets um, as far as Derby. You know, they're 0 for 12. A lot of third and fourths. Um, Essential Quality was fourth last year. Tacitus was third. Normandy Invasion, Frosted, and Mohamed were all fourth. And uh, some of the other uh, tappets that came in this race, Creator, Enforceable, Hofburg, Taprit, Tapature. Um, the interesting thing we kind of were talking about is a lot of these horses were horses that they didn't really have it all together um, in May. Um, but that extra, you know, an extra month in ex racing experience allowed horses like, you know, creator and uh, certainly essential quality and uh, tap red to, to be dominant in the Belmont and kind of feel like targets in that same camp. You know, he's got the ability uh, to run third or fourth here. Uh, hopefully he learns from being green. He's training well. Um, it just doesn't, doesn't really feel like a now horse to win the Kentucky Derby. So I think he's one to include underneath probably more in third uh and definitely in fourth and this is you know it is, i hate to say it, but it's potentially a, a belmont horse ed what do you think my uh i liked him a lot better admittedly uh before i saw the the raggers and sheets and i'm citing my source only because he is one of only three in the entire field who took a step back in the florida derby uh and i i think seasoned horses can bounce back from a step back, but with him having just the three career starts and not having raced at two, that that move backward numbers wise concerns me a little bit. Um, now at 20, 25 to one, which I agree with Sarah is, is a pipe dream. That's a little more palatable because uh, the talent is clearly there, uh, but I'm still a believer in the uh, two-year-old curse that Justify broke. Uh, we could have a long discussion about justify and you know whether we'll ever see one like that again uh i think it's very much still in play even though it, it, it's been broken and three horses this year uh fit that uh not having raced it to mold charge it being one of them so i'm going to toss them uh other than you know very thin with just my strongest opinions all right, from Charge It to Tis the Bomb, number nine in the field. And Tis the Bomb comes in off of a victory not far from here at Turfway Park on the synthetic in the Jeff Ruby Stakes stakes. And in fact, that was his second win in a row after having won on the same track in the John Battaglia Memorial. So you got a couple wins on the artificial. You got a couple wins on the turf. And you've also got a win on the dirt in a race that was taken off the turf at Ellis Park last July. So this is an experienced horse having gone five for eight for trainer Kenny McPeak. Brian Hernandez Jr. is the jockey and the odds 30 to one, both on the morning line and best priced in Las Vegas at the Westgate. Mark, let's start with you with Tis the Bomb. Well, I was going to say, why don't we let Ed start? Because I want to see exactly how much weight this horse is carrying. <laughs> All right, Ed, 210 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. Day. Yeah. You want to after, go in? Uh, after the stomach bug. Ed, go ahead. I want to hear. I want to hear everything you got on Tis the Bomb. And I love the horse. Uh, you know, as as both of you know, uh, I don't really consider myself uh, a visual handicapper by any means. I'm not deep into the replays, uh, but when you 
watch as many races as we do, you, you certainly recognize just stuff that kind of catches your eyes, what's impressive to you, especially from a going forward standpoint. It's a big reason I like Dunbar Road last year in the Breeders' Cup. I loved her spinster. Uh, you know, you're wrong sometimes too, but uh, I thought the Jeff Ruby stakes for a horse who, you know, eh, the Bataglia is this, you know, really a grade one horse. Is he for real? Uh, the turf and dirt questions. The way he just spurred it away, and, and granted, you know, that group overall, even though Tawny Port came back to win, no world beaters there, but I love watching him run. And really in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf, I would say somewhat similar. It was no match for the winner, but from a win ticket standpoint, which I did not cash in that race, uh, he kind of surprised me. I was like, man, this is a good horse uh, on turf. And at 30 to one, I'm willing to answer the dirt question. Maybe we'll have some moisture in the main track. I've heard that will help him. Certainly, I have no issue with the mile and a quarter being by hit at a bomb. And at the price, I just think he has a much better chance than the public is giving him credit for. And I'm going to take my shot, local jock, local trainer. It'd be a great story. And the last point I'll make is he's one of only two in the race with a million dollars in earnings. Uh, so I just feel like the class is being overlooked as well coming from Turfway. It all adds up to a value bet for me. All right, Mark, you want to kick the can down the road to Sarah or are you going to take it here? I, I can take it. I mean, no, I think Ed, Ed makes, makes a lot of good points. And, uh, you know, I really wouldn't dispute any of those. I mean, the, the fact that the horses run a big race is in synthetic and turf. Um, he's a quality closer, all those things. So for me, um, I think it would be it, it, it would be dumb not to have this horse in the bottom of the ticket in, in a third and fourth place. Um, you know, when it comes down to it, I, I do think the evidence, and he's training well, you know, as well. I do think the evidence with three dirt races, he has one win on the lead. So to me, I think there's some evidence that um, he doesn't want to take dirt kickback. And, you know, that's a hard part of training horses that don't have the speed to get to the lead is, uh, you know, how do you keep them outside or you train them to take dirt as a presser or a closer. Um, so, you know, I don't know if they can manage a trip. Maybe they stay wide. Maybe they get far back of, of some of that kickback. Uh, like Ed said, the horse should get the distance. He's done a lot of impressive things. I don't really want to doubt his ability. Um, but I think there's too many question marks for me to, to get him into the exacta. But it's going to be a really nice price. Uh, if they do manage a, a trip, he could come, come closing. And, and I think this is going to be a fun horse to watch the rest of his career. All right, Sarah, it's yours. If this is the next coming of Animal Kingdom, I will happily cheer on Ed and uh, let him buy something nice for the, us at the office, but this one's not for me. The pizza um, hedge. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> look, I, I agree with a lot of the points that I, I do believe he can get the distance. I do believe that he has a lot of talent. I do believe that he's faced a lot of classy horses but I don't believe that this is the surface that he wants really anything to do with. Next time he's on the turf or the synthetic, I would be happy to spend as much as I can that he's the winner. Uh, I think this is a very talented cult, but, and I get why they have to take their shot. It's the Kentucky Derby. You want to see what you have, but for a horse that I don't believe is going to be getting the lead or sitting in that first flight of those stalking to take kickback for the first time in a 20 horse field, when the surface is a question, I'm all set. You yeah, mentioned. Um, oh, go ahead, Mark. I, I should add, you know, the, one other issue we've talked to Kenny McPeak this week, and he did say that he wanted this horse forward as well. So okay. I don't know if that's a plan to kind of get him forward and wide. So he's not taking kickback, but I don't really love the idea of taking him out of the running style that, you know, I'd let, rather see him as a closer. So I think that's another question mark. But uh, anyway. Very interesting horse. Certainly intrigue on this horse. And you mentioned Animal Kingdom, Sarah. It was 2011 when Animal Kingdom was the last horse to come out of the race formerly known as the Spiral at Turfway and win here at Churchill Downs in the run for the Roses. And we come now to the morning line favorite, and that is Zandon, the bluegrass winner for Chad Brown, looking for his first derby win in seven tries. You have a three to one morning line for this horse, and it's a, a horse that has been taking money, as I mentioned earlier, in Las Vegas and has really worked his way up to being 
at least a co-favorite with Epicenter in Nevada. It's a closer we're looking at here. It was a maiden winner when he scored in the Bluegrass last month at Keeneland. Flavian Pratt, who has an asterisk win in the Kentucky Derby, is the rider. And so you're looking at three to one on the morning line and a best price in Las Vegas, just shy of five to one at plus 490. Ed? I definitely view him as, I am as the co most likely winner. I kind of punted on in that regard. Uh, I'll tweak a little bit to, you know, finally have a top ranking uh, percentage wise. But I love that in the bluegrass, you know, you talk about closers and Mo Donegal and the Wood Memorial, but Zandon was uh, on the lead by the eighth pole. And that's the, the closing trip, if you're going to do it, that gets it done in the Kentucky Derby. Both Mind That Bird and Orb struck the lead at the eighth pole for as far back as they were going into the far turn. That's the type of trip Zandon has, whereas Mo Donegal just nailed early voting on the wire. We don't see that hardly ever, ever, ever in the Kentucky Derby where the closer is just getting up in the shadow of the wires, they would say. So I greatly prefer Zandon's closing style to Mo Donegal. I think it makes him a bigger threat than Mo Donegal. And with all the pace we've talked about, certainly that aids his case as well. So a lot of things in his corner, mm -hmm. three to one, not in mine, which is why I'm glad I like a few long shots that I can pair with him. I don't know that he offers value on top, but I absolutely see him as the most likely horse to be in the gimmicks. All right, Sarah. I would agree completely. I think that he's your most likely winner in this race. This is one that I've been a fan of throughout his entire career. Um, he has raced at the mile and a three times where a lot of horses kind of build into more of a distance or route of ground over the course of their racing careers to prep for this race but he jumped into the mile and an eighth type of distance right away as a two-year-old finishing second in the Remsen to Modonegal very lengthy inquiry with that race that resulted in the suspension of Irad Ortiz for a couple of other rides as well that were a bit questionable I really needed Zandon as a single in that race that day so obviously I'll never forget it but to then come back dwell at the start and still come running on in the next race in the Risen Star behind some of the top contenders like Epicenter and Smile Happy and then to turn the tables in the bluegrass after all kinds of traffic and trouble and navigating his way through. I don't know that he's a deep closer. I think he can sit a bit more mid-pack if he has to. I think he has some tactical speed that gives him more options in this race. He doesn't have to be at the very back of the pack like some of these other closers. And I would agree that he's the likeliest winner. Mark, I, I worry about closers, and I get it. There's supposed to be more pace this year in the Derby. But, you know, every so often during this points era run where we've had front-running horses cross the line first in the last eight years, we hear, okay, there'll be pace in the race, and then there's not. So what do you think about Zandon and maybe against the pace issue that I'm raising here? You know, like Sarah said, he can lay tactically. Uh, you know, I don't think he's a closer that needs – to be in 20th and, and he won't be in 20th and you know maybe he's more like eighth or 10th or 12th uh Flavin Pratt has those options and you know I think the great thing about Zandon is I don't think there's really any knocks against him you know uh he's a closer in a race with pace he's got a great trainer he's coming in in this third off a layoff he's coming in off a win he's got a great jockey so I, I think he merits favoritism I agree with what everyone said that he's the most likely winner I think there's a you know, a big chance he runs first or second. So I think this is a horse that you can use uh, in first and second. Uh, he doesn't need to win. Uh, he could certainly have a trouble trip, run third, those sorts of things. It's a lot of things can happen, but he's coming up to the race uh, in, in a lot of good ways. And if, if he doesn't uh, get mired in a terrible trip, I think he's going to be there at the end. And, uh, you know, if you start to look at scenarios uh, of who can beat him and how, there's, there's just not that many. Uh, he should he should be close. So uh, I, I like him. I don't think three to one. Um, I think that's too low. I'm not sure about that morning line. I think he's going to be closer to four to one, uh, depending, but or at least uh, seven to two. Oh, you can run to Isn't Vegas and get him at almost Mark? five. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Isn't it up to you? It's it's up to you know mattress Matt could um, dump a lot on the favorite. Uh, he's doing a, a promotion again. Uh, if the ferret turns out like it's leaning towards Zandon, he pushes some money that way. Uh, that could uh, could lower his odds. You know, I, I think just looking at last year, Essential Quality went off at 290 to one, and that was a horse that was almost undefeated in a race that wasn't nearly as deep. 
this is a much deeper race. There's a lot of different ways you could go that I wouldn't want to talk people off of, of some of these different horses. And uh, so I think that's going to push Epicenter and Zandon up closer to four. I agree. Uh, Matt, you know, Mattress Max money could could have an impact, but I don't think it's going to uh, get down to like the central quality level of 291. Hmm. OK. Good food for thought. Yes, the Mattress Mac Factor will be certainly a great sidebar story that we will be following Friday and Saturday when uh, that he and his money get to town here in Louisville. All right, we're halfway through the field. And before we get to the second half, I want to get a snapshot from our handicapping team about the Kentucky Oaks on Friday. But first, let me make sure you get more than a snapshot on handicapping these big races, and especially the Kentucky Derby. And if, think about the money you're investing. If I asked you to invest nearly $100 to get some proprietary information, would you take that? Yeah? Okay, I'm going to go one better than that. I'm going to cut the price in half for you on this. If you're a smart horse player, you want to check out the Super Screener. Look, Mike Shuddy is going to be on the podcast in our regular Friday episode. He'll give us some background on that. So if you're on the fence about this, okay, he, he will push you into doing it. But why don't you get a head start on this and check it out right now? The Super Screener is based on years of analysis and of results. It tells you what's important and what's not in terms of a race and handicapping, not just the Derby, but the biggest races every week. It'll tell you what bad favorites might be out there and maybe some overlays that are available to you as well. The super screener are identifying those live long shots too that you can boost payoffs up to 10 times what you'd normally get. And just in time for the Derby, I mentioned half price, special edition of the super screener, normally $99, get it now for just $49. Now, where do you find it? Pretty easy. It's almost where you found this podcast. Might be where you found this podcast. Go to horseracingnation.com. Actually, type in the word picks, P I C K S dot horseracingnation.com. Picks dot horseracingnation.com. Check out the super screener. Some other options on there for you, too, if you want to go beyond the Derby. But just if you're isolating on the biggest race of the year, why not get the best help you're going to get all year? Check out the super screener from Horse Racing Nation. It's the Hardcore Handicappers pop-up episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. And I mentioned before we broke that we we're going to get a snapshot of Friday's running of the Kentucky Oaks. Race 11 on the 13 race card, posted for 5.51 Eastern time here at Churchill Downs. A mile and an eighth for 14 three-year-old fillies. Grade 1 Ashland Stakes winner Nest is the morning line favorite. Before we get your opinions, let me throw in this little pepper into the gumbo. The National Weather Service, as of our recording on Tuesday morning, said that on Friday, showers and possibly a thunderstorm, the high near 75, chance of precipitation, 90%. One to nine odds, Sarah. I'm going to think that uh, you'd be happy to uh, get the reality of that with a big price on the other side. But where are you going to go with that little proviso here with the weather for the Kentucky Oaks? Well, the rain doesn't talk me off of my top pick in here, a horse that I've been very high on since she broke her maiden, and that's number 10, Kathleen O. I think it's a little bit crazy that Nest is the favorite in here. I doubt that she will be the post-time favorite, um, but obviously four for four, and the way that she wins her races, this is not a style that we see win races usually at tracks like Aqueduct or Gulfstream Park, being so far back as a closer, most of the time being dead last early or just not really breaking on top and sitting way far back off the field. And when Javier Castellano says go, you see her actually accelerate and go. And I have a horse that is so push button like that. And that is so responsive to everything that the rider says, whether it's wait, go, pause, whatever the case may be. She's, she's, just a very classy filly and I'm excited to see the entirety of where her career goes and I think that this could be really the her stamping herself as the leader of this three-year-old division against some other very classy fillies in here. An exciting deep closer who won the Gulfstream Park Oaks last out seven to two on the morning line breaking from post 10 is Kathleen O. Mark? Yeah I'm a little torn on this race but I, I would tend to agree I mean, Kathleen O was, was very impressive at Gulfstream. She was undefeated. And, you know, just looking at her comments, you know, from that race, it wasn't that fast of a race. A mile and a 16th, that's that short stretch at Gulfstream. It's a speed track. 
you know, horses don't usually have a lot of success just coming from, you know, from last. And, and her comment was four wide throughout, you know, bit on the far turn, pulled away with a late mile drive, you know, very impressive the way she just circled that field and ran by. And, uh, you know, Ness kind of did the same thing, but I, I think Keeneland that opening weekend, it was wet and uh, it was playing a little bit to closers in the two turn races. And uh, she had that in her advantage. And so, you know, I, Sarah's really high on this horse. I think that's with good reason. I think this is one where, you know, you kind of want to ride it until uh, she and see how far she can go. Um, a couple others to be aware of in here, you know, obviously Ness, uh, you Gary is uh, 30 to one and could be the only speed. So could hang on for a long time. Uh, I would use those two uh, with Kathleen O and then maybe uh, the nine. Is gone. And Ed, what about you? Uh, for me, it's a really exciting race to bet. Uh, not only because of who I like to win, which, you know, we covered with both Kathleen O and Nest, but I don't think Echo Zulu or Secret Oath hit the number. Uh, and you eliminate both of those from the exotics and you have, a, I think, a big time opportunity, especially in a 14 horse field with dollar supers. Uh, hidden connection of all the fillies in here took the biggest step forward last out, which uh, lines up with what trainer Brett Calhoun said about drawing a line through her three year old debut. Uh, so she's kind of interesting as sort of the the outlier once you get past the other four. Got a Sapphire, had a decent number from the Pletcher bar last out uh could be in the mix is you know fifth sixth seventh choice something like that uh i do have kathleen o on top nest is going to be an a as well and i'm going to try to beat deco zoo and secret oath and all the other wagers nest five to two on the morning line as uh, previously mentioned the favorite uh, coming out of the ashland for todd pletcher and irod ortiz jr and you talked about echo zulu the reigning champion from last year as the top two-year-old philly Four to one on the morning line for Steve Asmussen and Joel Rosario in that one two finish with hidden connection in the fairgrounds Oaks. They were only a nose apart in what was Echo Zulu's three year old debut. So it, it certainly just it looks like just a fun race, a great betting race, as Ed mentioned. Are we so, in agreement that she's not going to be the third choice? Oh, Echo Zulu. I think she can yeah. yet be the favorite. Yeah, I just I don't see how she's third choice. I mean, I understand the two ahead of her in the morning line are the mm -hmm. two I like best, but the, the public is just not going to let the undefeated Breeders' Cup champion go off at a $10 horse. I, I just I don't see it. I agree. Happen. It's not it's not a good line. Sarah, you agree? Yeah. I mean, what has Echo Zulu done wrong? She only raced yeah. once as a three-year-old to come back. She's won every single race. She has early speed. She has had some of the, ba the fastest buyers as a two-year-old that we've seen. And this isn't the horse that I want on top, but I don't see her as uh, being completely dismissed by the betting yeah. public. Yeah. No, I, 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 I like her and I'm, I'm hoping, you know, look, I like her enough. I hope everyone dismisses her. She's terrible. <laughs> don't bet her. Well, and I just wanted to add that I wanted to echo what Ed said that, uh, you know, oh boy. I'm definitely against <laughs> Echo Zulo here and, uh, you know, all of her races, it just seemed like there wasn't a lot of pace. I, I think, you know, the spin away, she jumped out and she was fast, but the juvenile Phillies was sort of gifted to her. There was no other speed or, or no other speed that broke well. And, you know, and she was life and death in her, in her three-year-old debut to win by a nose over hidden connection. Uh, on paper, Hugh Geary is much faster. So that's going to be a new dimension is, is fighting with another horse or sitting off another horse the entire time. And I think this horse is a great bet against and will probably be the favorite. Okay. A lot of thoughts on a very good race, the Kentucky Oaks on Friday. Back to the Kentucky Derby now and the second half of the field from the middle out as far as the 20 horse gate is concerned. And we go to Pioneer of Medina, a horse that finished third last out in the Louisiana Derby behind Epicenter and Zozos. Uh, Todd Pletcher, the trainer here. Joe Bravo getting the ride. Used to be Jersey Joe, but now based in California. And a man not with a lot of Derby experience, just three times racing in the Kentucky Derby. Pioneer of Medina, 30 to 1 on the morning line. You can get him in Las Vegas at 40 to 1 at Circa and the Westgate. Mark? Yeah, I mean, he's one that I think you don't want to be too quick to dismiss. Um, he's improving and, uh, you know, he's you know, obviously the third bunch of, of the Pletcher horses, uh, third best of the Pletcher horses. Um, you know, he ran a, a decent race in Louisiana Derby, could improve here. The knocks against him is, 
you know, he's sort of a pace horse and uh, a stalker in there's potentially more pace in here. So I, I don't really like him, but, um, you know, Joe, Joe Bravo's up. Um, they're also taking the blinkers off. So they're kind of trying to try some things out, maybe take him off a little bit more. But he is working well. He's Pletcher and Pletcher's, you know, he's done well before it hit the board with the other Pletcher. So I don't want to be too dismissive, dismissive of him, but don't don't really love him. Ed, with the blinkers off, do we think maybe he will not go to the lead as much as he has been prone to do, certainly uh, early this year and late last year? Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, he had some issues before the Louisiana Derby and, and still ran well. Uh, I'm wondering if, you know, the blinkers had a role to play in terms of going to the gate that day, if, if that was, and then certainly when you talk about the Derby, uh, hoopla on the 20 horses, uh, you know, would make sense that they'd want as, as calm a horse as possible before the race. I, I like them, uh, not as much as I like Tis the Bomb and, you know, at equal prices, I, you know, I really like Tis the Bomb. But Pioneer Medina for me is just that that key. I've talked, you know, several times. We've already been through Epicenter and Zandon, who I like a lot. Uh, Pioneer of Medina is, is the one that, okay, if it chalks out and I'm wrong about Tis the Bomb, Pioneer Medina is sort of my my safety net, and maybe I'm wrong about him too, and he doesn't run well. But at, at thirty to one, and certainly forty to one, I would bet him to win at that price. Uh, I just think he's had races that stick around, and the Louisiana path looks to be formful, and he held his own there. So at a big price, I'm going to play him to stick around again. Sarah. Well, the issues that Ed's referring to, he actually got loose before the Louisiana Derby and then ended up running around a bit before loading in and running his race. He does finish third that day to Epicenter and Zozo's. Um, sitting mid-pack, he kind of just stays there. He doesn't really make any sort of flashy move or you go out in front and really set the pace. He kind of just runs his race and sticks around. And this is a horse that I'm really excited to see where he goes for the rest of his career as far as races that he ends up in this summer or perhaps later on on the Triple Crown Trail. Um, I wouldn't completely write him off, but as far as a win candidate, uh, I just don't think he's as good as some of the others in here. But I think that at that price and for this trainer, you could I could make a case for him to be third in here. Now to number 12, and a very intriguing horse, and that is Taba, looking to become only the second horse in Derby history and the first since 1883, uh, Leonidas, to win with only two previous races on his resume. Those two were wins, including the Santa Anita Derby in his first time out for Tim Yachtine. Yes, he was a Bob Baffert horse in his victorious debut uh, back in March. Uh, so Mike Smith, the most experienced rider on the least experienced horse, and you got 12 to 1 on the morning line here, but uh, actually that looks like an overlay versus what you're seeing in Las Vegas where you get no better than 8 to 1. Ed? This is my toss of those uh, expected to, to take some money, and I think 12 to 1 may be a little ambitious by Mike. I agree with Vegas, so to speak, that he'll take more money than that. Uh, don't like the two career starts. Don't like the one work into this since the Santa Anita Derby. Uh, I just think you're asking a lot of a horse who, before the San Anita Derby, there were some percolations that the connections didn't want to even run in that. Uh, the vets list, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, could never be a shock based on that 111 versus net speed rating and one of the best Ragazin figures in the race. The fastest horse sometimes wins races, but this is one that I think is going to be on a lot of tickets and you know, in terms of taking a stand among the short prices, he's one I'm taking against. Hummer Zidane owns this horse, paid $1.7 million for him at a basic Tipton sale down in Florida last year. Hummer Zidane is the owner of the late Medina Spirit. And so for nine months and change, he was a Kentucky Derby winner until the DQ this past winter. Sarah? Clearly the talent is there. Uh, the price tag is there. <laughs> This horse may end up being the best of this three-year-old crop as we go down the line. But to ask a horse to win the Kentucky Derby in their third career start, not having raced as a two-year-old, not having the same type of foundation that we see as far as workouts and other things going into this race, I think it's asking too much. 
Um, he hasn't had to deal with the kind of trips that others have had to overcome. And I think that while putting him in here makes sense as far as figures and his ability, I don't think it's really fair to him as far as what he'll have to deal with mentally, as far as the crowd and all the kickback and the 20 horse field in here. Um, it'd be interesting to see what happens after this race and how he does in here, but this isn't one that I'll be using on my tickets. Mark, how do you feel about the number 12? You know, I agree with everything that's been said, um, but he, you know, he is the fastest horse on paper. Uh, and a lot of different by a lot of different figure makers, um, you know, with two starts, it could, he could bounce and come back. Um, but he could actually bounce and still win the race, which is interesting. And, you know, the one thing that intrigues me is, you know, the way they ran last time, they just kind of stayed wide of the field, uh, sat about three lengths off the pace. And, he, and they just kind of let the battle ensue between uh, Forbidden Kingdom and, uh, and Messier. And, you know, I kind of see them doing the same thing here. Uh, a young horse, um, they're not going to want him to take dirt. And so, you know, if we see uh, the three, four, and six kind of going out to the lead epicenter Summers tomorrow in Messier, uh, I think he's in a spot with a lot of closers to his inside that he could sort of be that four wide and get that sort of American Pharaoh trip. And uh, that's a really good trip. And if he's good enough, you know, to keep going um yeah you know, I, I, I probably want to have that as a backup so maybe a b for me you know if he if he is the real deal and he doesn't stop you know then a, i want to have an exacto like a table over zandon or a table over modonical uh as sort of a backup exacta for sure so um it's it's tough i mean we don't usually see a horse come into the derby off two starts no, no rarest of all uh, certainties in fact the last time it happened the only time it happened the president was chester arthur uh, and in fact, uh, I actually shook his hand that day uh, at the track, I think maybe, or, or not. Foggy memory. Number 13 is simplification for Antonio Sano. Jose Ortiz will get the ride as he has in the last two, including a fountain of youth victory. And then a third place finish in the Florida Derby. Sano told me before that race that they were not really going to be out to try to win it as much to try to teach the horse how to get into traffic and then maybe fade late. He said that before the race, and that was in the Florida Derby where he finished third. They already had the points to get into the Kentucky Derby. And so take that on the value you wish in this particular case. Simplification in stall 13, 20 to one on the morning line, 30 to one at Circa. Sarah? He's interesting. I think talking about horses that have had difficult trips and had to overcome adversity he's definitely fits that profile as he didn't get out of the gate well in the holy bull he then ends up having to change his entire running style to switch off and then come running late to uh to challenge white a barrio then gets the win in the fountain of youth with all the drama ensuing in there yeah um i i kind of knowing what the trainer's intentions were in the florida derby it does I feel like make a difference in terms of the lens that I view that through, but I would kind of want to see more from him to, to be challenging on the front end after classic causeway dipped out of there and then end up fading back. I see him as being the lower echelon of the Florida horses in general. Mark. Um, you know, it's a difficult one, but I do think this is a, a, a 30 to one that you want to include, especially in third in your trifectas. Um, he's run a, you know, a couple of good races from a couple, couple of different ways. And the fact that the trainer, you know, has said he wants to run off the pace, like the fountain of youth, um, you know, this is a pretty wide open race as far as under, you know, third. And, and so I think this is one that, uh, you know, again, if it, if it gets very logical up top with uh, Zandon over, uh, you know, another logic course you're like in second, you want to have simplification as a, in third or fourth. Um, I don't really see him as a win contender in any way or an exact contender. Ed? Yeah, I don't like them. Uh, just the, the numbers aren't there for me. And, you know, I look at the Florida Derby and Holy Bull and definitely see White Barrio is being better than him in both those instances. And then he won uh, over some horses who haven't really flattered him coming out of the Fountain of Youth. So, you know, it's such a big price. Uh, one of those, I'll, I guess I'll be a little sheepish if he blows things up because 
he's around, but definitely in the, the bottom rung of the ones I, I don't like. Maybe it's just the bias of having been in the barn when Antonio Sano talked to me about what they had up their sleeve for simplification in the Florida Derby, but I am going to make him my big long shot play. I got to have one somewhere out there. And so he's going to be my bomber coming in there. The uh, lucky number 13, I say, crossing my fingers and holding my breath. Number 14, another long shot, and that is Barber Road. And uh, Barber Road coming in off of a second place finish in the Arkansas Derby. A closer for Johnny Ortiz, Ray Gutierrez riding in his first Kentucky Derby. And this is a horse that is 30 to one on the morning line and 45 to one in Las Vegas. You can get him at Circa. Mark? You know, it's another one that, um, you know, there's some possibility that he could close. Um, didn't really love the Oakland horses. You know, they didn't do very well at Keeneland. Um, you know, not a lot of excitement. Um, I think if you start going, you know, fishing with the 30 to ones and going deeper, this is another one that you could use, especially, you know, when I say that it depends on how tight you're on the top. If you're really convicted, uh, Zandon's going to win this thing and you've got, you know, three horses per second, then you can go deeper in third and, and that's where you can get a really nice trifecta. So, um, I don't want to say that he can't hit the board, but uh, again, don't like him at all for the exact Ed? Uh, it's, I'm fascinated because I know a lot of people like him and I get it. And in terms of connections uh, that are fun to cheer for, Ray Lou and, and Johnny Ortiz both uh, would be a lot of fun to see him shock the world. And just the more I look, the more I would be shocked. Uh, you know, I would say he's right there with the 80 and 90 to one horses uh, that we've talked about previously uh, in the book in Vegas, uh, you know, from an underneath standpoint, I would put him in the happy Jack category because he does run his race. He's around at the end. Uh, he seems to finish well. So that's a positive if you're looking for a filler underneath, but the reality is happy Jack has better numbers. And I think happy Jack's going to be a longer price, even in the third and fourth slots in the super. So, he to me is sort of a better exotics filler than Barbara Road is, but just the way he runs his races, it's impossible for me to, to toss him completely as I am with a horse like Summer is Tomorrow or Taba at a shorter price. So using very, very defensively with the horses I really like. It was a sprint. It was in November, but Sarah, Barbara Road does have a win on the track here at Churchill Downs. I mean, um acclimating to the surface is certainly important and there are some people that really like this horse that whose opinions I respect but to me I, I guess you can make excuses for him that he hasn't had a really good trip and I I have to respect his consistency but I just don't think he's good enough the figures kind of suggest that as well whichever ones you're looking at um, in general there's just others in here that I prefer a lot more to end up filling out those exotics and I could see him being, as we mentioned earlier, maybe a grade three, grade two horse down the road, or maybe he matures and steps up later on. But at this level right now, I don't see him as a top player. Toss for me, too. That win that he had here at Churchill was in a $30,000 allowance race. As he comes in, we'll be making, let's see now if I count that right, his ninth start when he goes in the Kentucky Derby. Let's go now to the Florida Derby winner, and that's White Abario, was the last of the Derby horses to arrive here at Churchill Downs for Safi Joseph Jr. Tyler Gaffaleone will be in the irons. We've got his first time out on the track, at least this time around, on Tuesday after arriving on Monday, but he's been here and done that before finishing third and a troubled third in the Kentucky Jockey Club last fall when Smile Happy and Classic Causeway finished one, two. Uh, so now we've got a horse at the number 15 post at 10 to one in White Barrio, 12 to one in Las Vegas at Circa and Caesars. Ed? Uh, this is kind of one of those I would put in the type of bucket, uh, just can win, but the numbers don't really stack up against others. And I'm pretty bearish uh, the, the longer I've looked at some of these races, uh, I would say the Florida path uh, just hasn't really excited me. The more I, I've looked at the ways people are, the ways these horses are coming to Kentucky, uh, simplification I'm against, uh, Charge It has his issues and took a step back. 
on the sheets and then white abario done nothing wrong uh this is the, the coldest uh florida derby winner i can remember in some time in terms of just no one seems to like them on top so if you do you're getting a much better price than typical of a horse with this resume uh but i'm with the group that just kind of wondering you know is he going to be worth even whatever price he is and my answer is no sarah uh, this is a horse that I continually underestimate and have been wrong about, and I'm probably going to keep doing it until he really proves me wrong outside of Florida. Um, obviously, you know, we talk a lot about how Safi Joseph Jr. isn't the same uh, trainer outside of Florida. His stats aren't as bad as I think people would make them out to be outside of his home state now. But this one, I... I I have to like his running style. I will say that he will sit off the pace in here and uh, he's shown that he can be that sort of presser stalker and get that kind of trip. I don't know that post vote 15 really does him any favors with that. He's going to have to go to get position early. Um, I wouldn't say that he's impossible, but he won't be on my tickets. Mark. You know, he's an interesting horse and uh, you know, as you know, we talked to Safi jo Joseph the other morning, Ron, and I thought he was really, you know, impressive in the sense that uh, he said in the Florida Derby, they, they went out to give him the best horse in the race trip, meaning, uh, and I asked him, what did he mean by that? And he said, well, they thought they, they, they potentially had the, the right horse for the Derby and they wanted to find out. They didn't want to have a bad trip and then come out of the race not knowing what they had. So they wanted to figure out you know, it, it, do they have, you know, what, what they need to go on to the Derby. And so, you know, if you watch the Florida Derby, I mean, I agree that the, like I said, the numbers weren't amazing, but uh, he's wide the whole time. And again, Gulfstream's not a track that you'd really want to be wide on. It's not a right. track that you want to close on. So I think it's a really impressive race. Um, I think he can get a good spot from out there potentially. Um, and then I guess my question with him is, you know, where do they put him? Um, I would like to see him a little bit off the pace. Like in, in the Florida Derby, he was fifth by two and a half in the first call, uh, something like that. I think he could be around for a long time. So for me, he's a B in, in second um, and uh, and definitely a horse that could, could run third. And I think this is a horse that has a potentially big future when he gets back to a mile and eighth races. A barrio is a village or town in Spain uh, for which this horse is named White Barrio number 15. Number 16, finally, we get to the Brad Coxes. Look, Brad Brad won the, uh, <laughs> the Kentucky Oaks with Monomoy Girl from post 14. He seems to have taken custody of all the outside posts for the most part. And this is the first of his three that we mentioned. Of course, he had the uh, de facto or the promoted Kentucky Derby winner last year with Mandaloon going from second to first. Florent Giroux had that ride and he'll have this one on Cyberknife, a winner of his last two, most recently the Arkansas Derby to give him his uh, grade one triumph. And he did win against Barber Road coming in second. That was an off of Lasix performance. And of course, because uh, these stakes are all off Lasix, he will continue to be just that. 20 to one on both the morning line and in Las Vegas at the Westgate. Sarah? If you want a horse that's figuring things out at the right time, he seems to fit that profile. That allowance win was kind of the breakout race for him after showing some hints of talent, but not really putting things all together. And then obviously the win in the Arkansas Derby he drew off and won pretty impressively in there, but I don't see him stacking up against some of the other top contenders in here. I think that he would need to take another pretty big step forward in order to be hitting the board. Mark? Yeah, I kind of agree with Sarah. Um, you know, he's another gun runner like Taba, but he's not as fast. He's further outside. He's, you know, Russ race more, but less accomplished. Um, you know, I just think he's kind of a, got too much to do uh, from an improvement standpoint, from being outside standpoint, another pace presser from out there. But it's hard to envision a scenario um, that, you know, that works out well for him. So I don't like him. Ed? Yeah, ditto. Uh, this might be our, our most agreement. He ran a very similar race, in my mind, to Smile Happy. Made that big middle move, split horses, professional certainly visually loved watching it. Uh, the big difference there is, you know, Barbara Rowe caught secret oath for second uh, and 
a ways back to fourth, I suppose. Whereas Zandon, your morning line favorite here, caught Smile Happy and a long way back to third. Uh, if there were a head to head with similar pricing, I'd love to bet the max on Smile Happy versus Cyberknife, even though one was second and the other one, they're grade one preps. Uh, this one just isn't for me in this spot. Here's a horse that wasn't supposed to be here. A couple weeks ago, trainer Brian Lynch said, nah, we're not coming. And then all of a sudden he showed up amongst the other derby workers one day and he said, nah, we're not coming. And then the elderly <laughs> owners of Classic Causeway convinced Lynchy to, uh, to come. And so here's Classic Causeway back in the mix. Number 17 uh, came in last in his last race. And that was in the Florida Derby. Before that was a two-time winner in graded stakes and derby preps at Tampa Bay Downs, namely the Sam F. Davis and the Tampa Bay Derby. So with the checkered last start, and when was the last time a derby horse hit the board after finishing last in his last prep? I went back to 1990 to check it out. The bugler may be trying to tell me when it was. Don't know for sure. Ed, maybe that's research for you. 30 to 1 on the morning line and Classic Causeway. You can get him as long as 50 to 1 in Las Vegas. And so, uh, Mark, let's go ahead and start with you. Yeah, I mean, he's been going to the lead his last three races, and obviously it didn't work out in the Florida Derby. So I do think there's a good chance they don't try that tactic again. You know, he did rate and uh, finish second to Smile Happy in the Kentucky Jockey Club. Uh, they've got Julian Leperu, a more patient rider up. So I think they may do that and and uh, take a big package. But he's not a factor. All right, Ed? Uh, 50 to 1, I'd love to book every dollar out there of anyone betting this horse at 50 to 1. Uh, I think I have him at 200 plus to one, and that's just because there's no need to be ridiculous. Uh, this would be the most shocking result of any race I've ever watched in my life if he were to win. And Sarah, to you. I asked a question on Twitter the other day of who would be the speed of the speed in this year's Kentucky Derby, and the fact that this horse was second choice out of Messier, Summers, Tomorrow, and Zozos. I mean, bet him if you want to, but this is one of the first tosses for me. I don't want a horse that finished last in their prior prep. I don't want a horse that had everything go their own way and win prior to that. And he hasn't had a win where he's had to deal with any sort of traffic trouble or deal with another major pace presence on the front end. And I think he will in here. Uh, I get it. If this is as an owner, your one shot to kind of have that horse in the derby and enjoy the experience why you would want to take it if there's nothing physically wrong with him but if this was my horse i would be passing and saving him for a, another day they're testing out the uh, sound system here at churchill downs i swear to goodness there there may not be 10 people in the grandstands but i'm going to guess back at the home office downtown you can hear it was a cc and company from the 1990s but there we are. Forgive me uh, turning on and off the microphone so you don't have to be blasted uh, out by we, that. We'd forgive you if you didn't turn it on. <laughs> Very good. Tawny Port, number 18 uh, in the race, will be uh, coming in as another uh, long shot. This is the uh, third, as it were, of the Brad Coxes in terms of ranking the horses. Uh, he finally named Ricardo Santana Jr. to be the jockey. Coming off of the win in the Lexington when he thought maybe he might have needed to top up points, didn't turn out he needed to do that. He was second only uh, a couple weeks before that in the Jeff Ruby Stakes behind Tiz the Bomb. 30 to 1 on the morning line, 90 to 1 at Circa. Ed, let me start with you to talk about Tawny Port. I'm guessing the uh, the 90 on this one versus 50 on Classic Causeway has more to do with exposure from earlier bets uh, in the cycle than their actual chances now, because uh, certainly at, at 90, he's, uh, I don't want to say a good bet, but more palatable. I really want to love him because he was second to Tiz the Bomb, uh, but you know the reality in my mind, especially looking at the dirt starts only, is he's just not fast enough, and I think he'll be as used as horses like Happy Jack and Barber Road, and maybe even a little more because of the Cox factor. And for that reason, I'm pretty much against, but I would say that from a Jeff Ruby stake standpoint, if it's a repeat of that exact, I, I better put a deuce on it or something, but overall he's not for me. 
All right, Sarah, that brings us to you on Tawny Port. Well, I think the question that he answered that tis the bomb necessarily didn't is that he can handle the surface. Um, he went off at a fairly generous price in comparison to his morning line in the Lexington. But overall, I don't really see that as a super contentious field. And I think that he would also have to take a step forward in terms of class and uh, general speed and ability in order to be competitive here. And Mark? Yeah, you know, it's tough to see it. He just doesn't look fast enough. Um, he is a closer. He's 30 to one, but a more morning line he's going to be way outside so i mean stranger things have happened i would if i would touch him it would be in fourth and nowhere else that brings us to the uh, last of the brad cox horses but maybe uh the one that will be uh, setting the pace among the three and that is zozos manny franco will get the ride zozos was undefeated in two races coming into the louisiana derby went in there as a, a five to two shot and lost to epicenter by two and a half lengths and so he is 20 to one from the 19 hole on the morning line 25 to one at all three books in las vegas where they are making book on the kentucky derby and so to talk about zozos let's start with sarah yeah, I really liked him in the Louisiana Derby. I liked that he didn't necessarily need the lead in there, that he was going to be forwardly placed, but wasn't one of those horses that absolutely needs to be controlling things on the front end. And uh, I think that he showed a lot of professionalism having only two starts prior to that. Obviously, the price went way down on this horse in that race. He does end up finishing second to epicenter. But I think you have to take into consideration the price discrepancy between these two. If this is a horse in only his third career start that is finishing second to probably one of the best in here. Um, I don't see how he finds a way to make a trip work for him where he wins. But I think honestly, out of the three for Brad Cox, I would want this one over the other two. All right, Mark, that brings us to you. You know, I just don't see how this horse does it from the 19 post here. Uh, you know, we talked about um, the speed and there's some pressers in this race. I count about, you know, 10 or 11 pressers inside of them or, or speed horses. So uh, he's not fast enough if he wanted to go to the lead. Um, I, I just think this is a horse that's going to be extremely wide. I'm not sure how he works out a trip. Um, he hasn't shown that he can close from way off of it. So uh, I just don't, I just don't see it from a running style standpoint. You know, he's not um, one of the worst horses in the race, but I just don't see any way he works anything out from the 19. So for, for me, he's a total toss. And Ed, what about you? Yeah, not, not much uh, interest in him, which is too bad because I was born on the 19th and, the Derby is the only race I can bet my birthday. Uh, so uh, be wasted money this year. It's, it's interesting to me, uh, you know, working in this business for 20 years now, the evolution of handicapping the Derby uh, for pedigree and distance. Uh, dosage has certainly fallen out of favor, but just even overall, you, you don't seem to read as much about it. And I think based on some of the pedigrees we've seen win lately, there's a reason for that. And I get it. Uh, but of all the pedigrees in this race, Munnings out of a forestry mare certainly does not scream to me a mile and a quarter, even on his best day. So with the post and the things Mark and Sarah both already mentioned, Zozo's uh, zero, zero involvement for me. Finally, at least in terms of the main entries for the Derby, we come to Ethereal Road. Got into the race with the late scratch of Un Oho because of an injury before entries were taken on Monday. That brings 86-year-old Hall of Famer D. Wayne Lucas back to the Derby. Luis Contreras will have the ride. In fact, last time Wayne was in the Derby, it was with... Uh, Luis Contreras riding. This time we're talking about a horse that finished fourth in the Lexington Stakes, seventh before that in the Bluegrass. Best finish in the Stakes was his second in the Rebel behind Unoho. He is 30 to 1 on the morning line, and you can get him at, at this, uh, of all the numbers at Circa is good for these. 92 to 1 at Circa. Mark, what do you think about Ethereal Road? I, I just think he's another toss and being even if he wasn't on the outside and, and, and being out there, it's just, uh, it's a complete toss for me. All right. And Ed? Yeah, there's not much to like. And I mentioned, you know, being a little concerned that Charger took a step back uh, in his numbers while going from the Rebel to Bluegrass. 
to Lexington, Ethereal Road pretty much went off a cliff along with Classic Causeway. Impossible to see the turnaround needed to contend here. And Sarah will close out the main field with you. One of the things that really jumps off the page immediately with this horse to me is that he's never run a buyer over an 85 and that alone <laughs> just doesn't do it here. Uh, there is no way that a horse that has never run a buyer over an 85 is in contention with others that have run in triple digit territory. <laughs> It was interesting that when uh, Wayne was asked during the week, would he come into the race, Nader, as an also eligible? And he said, no, I don't want to be stuck with the 20 spot if we end up drawing in. Well, and then he gets stuck with it anyway in the draw, so there you go. Uh, speaking of the also eligibles, we have two for this race. We have the third place finisher from the Jeff Ruby Stakes, Rich Strike for Eric Reed with Sonny Leon on standby. And Rattle and Roll, the other also eligible, would take the blinkers off with James Graham up for Kenny McPeak, sixth in the bluegrass last time out. So why don't we get a snapshot from each of you about those two. Sarah, what about you? You know, for what it's worth, out of all the horses that Mark and I saw warming up and stretching their legs and turning in their workouts on the backside, Rich Strike was one of the ones that really stood out to me the most as one of the most composed, uh, really efficient stride, just like this big hulking kind of horse that seems like he could run all day. And obviously the surface is a question for him as well. I don't think he's good enough, but I think that, you know, beauty pageant wise, he definitely fits the bill. And then rattle and roll, I just, I don't think he's good enough either. Um, his two-year-old form obviously has not translated to three in the same ways that one may have expected or hoped. And I would be hard pressed to use either of them in any sort of wagers in this race. Ed, what about you? Uh, I'm shocked that this is the first time I'm hearing of a Leonidas stakes after all the talk of the a Derby winner with just uh, with two career starts. Is that the, the trend he is from 1883? Uh, this one was third in it. I mean, if either draws in, I would say I like them a little more than Classic Causeway or Summers Tomorrow or Theo Road, uh, but but that would be it. So really not a ton of interest in either. And Mark, as far as the also eligibles from your point of view? Um, yeah, there's not a lot to like. Uh, I guess the one thing I would say about them is they're both very deep closers. Uh, you know, Rich Strike seemed to take off a little bit more on the synthetic, so I'd probably maybe lean against him a little bit more. Um, you know, if uh, if the pace gets hot, you know, and a lot of times, you know, it's the horse that clunks up for fourth might be the tenth best horse in the race, tenth most talented or 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 more. And you know, just an example when Justify ran off, uh, Good Magic was second, Audible was third but instilled regard clunked up at 88 to one for fourth and uh, uh, keyed a $19,000 superfecta. So um, a rattle and roll is a horse I would, I would use in fourth if he got in. All right. And by the way, uh, that is Will Smith. I'm hearing now being played here on the PA system. It is either him or uh, on the PA with an old recording, or he's about to come and cold cock me uh, just so I can uh, get this thing finished up. Uh, we will get a final thought from each of our handicappers as to how they're going to play the Kentucky and maybe their best bet. Before I get to that, though, let me tell you the regular episode of the RFRP posts Friday, and it is stacked. Guests include Epicenter's trainer Steve Asmussen, the trainer of Chargett and Mo Donegal and Pioneer Badina, Todd Pletcher, Summers, Tomorrow's trainer, Trainer Bupat Simar, we're efforting a jockey or two. The media mayor of Louisville, Pat Forty from Sports Illustrated, will be along. And for handicappers, you've heard me talk today about the super screener, the creator himself, Mike Shuddy, will be joining us too. So the regular episode posts uh, right where you found this one. And if you're listening after Friday or after Thursday night, just click ahead to the next episode and you will hear the regular episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. Stand by, best bets on the Derby as we continue and wrap up the Hardcore Handicappers episode of the RFRP. Past performances heard on the Ron Flatter Racing Pod are provided by Brisnet, the only place you can get Kieran speed points to map the pace of any race. Check it out and get the PPs for the Kentucky Derby or for that matter, any race, anytime at brisnet.com. Final advice on the Kentucky Derby. I, I'm gonna give Twitter handles here on everybody, but uh, Mark Midland, I, uh, where's your Twitter handle? 
I think it's M Midland, but I haven't I haven't been very active on Twitter. Now, you haven't used that since the late 40s, as I understand, right? I got in pretty early on. This is it to monitor me. Yeah, once a year. <laughs> That's right. Uh, go ahead and give us your best ticket for the Derby. So I'm, I'm really kind of looking at the pace. And so I'm going to work around uh, Zandon and Modonegal uh, with maybe like a Messier, uh, Taiba, um, maybe White Barrio in second. And uh, and then maybe flip it a little bit where Zandon or Modonegal only gets second. And for me, that's a little bit more of a backup, but maybe a Messier winning small amount with a type of winning. I don't know that I really see White Barrio uh, winning. I probably would keep him just on second. So that's kind of where I would work on those five. You find her on Twitter and for that matter on a lot of social media at Outrun the Odds. Sarah El Badwi, your play for Kentucky Derby 148. I think it really depends on what kind of price we actually see on charge it. If he gets bet down to be third choice or something like that, um, then it's kind of a chalky type of race for as far as my top picks go. The major horse that I wanted to use is my sort of crazy long shot to really spice things up and exotics is no longer in this race. And uh, a lot of people think that that's going to save me some money. So now I have to find somebody else to sort of fit that profile I haven't fully decided on who that is yet, but I will say that to me, the most important player in this race, whether you like him to actually hit the board or not, is summer is tomorrow. He is going to be a major deciding factor in everything that happens in here. And I think that if he gets a clean break and he goes, that he ends up being the horse that decides the fate of everybody else. Agreed. And he has the longest walk to get here from Quarantine Barn to way out across the street over by the feed and tax store. So uh, right there. But I, I have a hunch they'll be able to, you know, he'll get here without being winded too much. A man who will never get winded, and he is on Twitter at EJXD2. Ed DeRosa, your top derby plays. Uh, it's, it's Chinese menu approach for me. Column A is Tis the Bomb and Pioneer of Medina. Column B is Zandon and Epicenter. Uh, I won't say I need one from each because if Tis the Bomb and Pioneer, the Pioneer of Medina both run well, that's fine. Uh, but I'm recognizing that the favorites have earned that mantle and I expect at least one of them to run well. And for me to do well in the Derby, I'll need one of my long shots to run well at to run well with them as well. So 911 with 310 and uh, a bunch in third and fourth in the supers, hopefully some long shots and uh, let's buy some pizza for the crew. <laughs> yes, actually, I still owe, don't I still owe you a meal, Ed? I think I owe you a meal from that bet that there was uh, there wasn't going to be baseball before the Derby, and so yeah. that, that and didn't... and Jimmy John's in the parlay this week doesn't count. <laughs> okay, restaurant plugs for twelve hundred, Mayim. All right, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to play. Look, I know it's uh, potentially chalky, but I'm going to put Epicenter on top. But I'm going to include Simplification and Crown Pride, and then Ed can scold me for getting sucked into the vortex of that UAE. <laughs> Darby mess that we've been enduring for all these years. My thanks again very much to Mark Midland, to Sarah El Badwi, to Ed DeRosa, and I'm sure as you're listening, you're going to thank them for all the insight they've been able to provide. We look forward to your company on Friday for the normal episode that will include, as we mentioned, Mike Shuddy. Don't forget to go to picks.horseracingnation.com to check out the super screener. So until Friday, this is Ron Platter saying best wishes on your derby bets and hope you're cashing them and not trashing them.